Hello everybody, we are here in Arizona for Drift Week and my friend Kelly towed out with Chelsea 300 and how many thousand miles is it? 360,000 now? It still moves pretty good. Yeah, 360,000 mile Dodge truck, which is just amusing to me. He brought out um, one of our drivers with an E36 M3's car, and he also brought out Chelsea's car to do some Drift Week. Chelsea's a little bit busy, so he's not gonna do all of Drift Week with us, but he'll be at Freedom Factory, and he brought the Pennzoil Mustang, which is pretty crazy. So this is Kelly, I met Kelly. Where did I meet you first, at Ebisu? I feel like we met here in the US first, but yeah. the longest inter interaction was in Ebisu. Yeah, my first real remembrance of him is at Ebisu. He was driving a 180SX over there. He's always so positive and so fun to be around. I love being around Kelly. Um, and right now he works at the School of Drift with Chelsea. So he's currently maintaining a bunch of E36, teaching and doing all kinds of stuff. And I thought it'd be really fun, just like I did with the interview with James over at Ebisu, chat with him about what it's like to keep a fleet of drift cars alive. This is probably one of the larger drift fleets in the US, which in Japan they have hundreds at Ebisu. Here you have six? Six running at one time. So. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna ask him a bunch of questions since how long have you been working on these things now? Uh, since March. Okay, so a good part of almost half a year, which is kind of how a lot of the Ebisu guys come in and out. Um, what are you doing specifically? Mechanical work and teaching? Uh, mostly mechanical work, uh, teaching some classes. COVID has pretty slowed much uh, slowed things down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's just what Chelsea tells me from last year, we're down a little bit, but mm -hmm. that's to be expected. So in the meantime, flipping cars, doing things like that, modifying the truck. We put an extended uh, range tank on that thing, which is awesome. <laughs> I'm telling you, like, 490 miles and it's still at a half a tank yeah and when it says you have a hundred mile range left it, it still has like 20 gallons in it it's, wow. it's amazing you can p bypass so much crap yeah but other than that um yeah just maintaining the cars it's it's been a dream come true honestly so how many <laughs> dream come true working on chelsea's bmws that's funny <laughs> so how many hours a week do you actually work on the cars i don't keep and is it track. just you is it full time uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, full time. And that's without all the students coming through right now. So you've got six cars. Are they all M3s? They're all E36s, right? They're mostly E36s. There's one E46 that's technically an E36 M3. I think the owner that <laughs> had it before uh, wrecked the E36 uh -huh. and then just swapped all the parts into the E46. But it's one of the nicest cars we have. Like It drives amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so how many hours do you really spend on the cars? You think 40 hours a week, 100 hours a week, two hours a week? You're like, just mm, ballpark. Somewhere between 60 and 70. Okay, so it's a pretty full week, 60 to 70 hours. Um, and how many hours does it take to prep a car for students? And like, does that car, do you prep the car and it does 10 days of drifting or does it do one day of drifting? Or is it, you know, like how much maintenance does it take first driving ratio, do you think? Every single time someone gets in the car, we, we go over it. So if we have six students and we run all six cars in one day, the next day and a half is doing nut and bolt checks, fluid checks. Uh, just I check to make sure the seats are still mounted solid, the shifter bushings. It's really go through everything. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just we want to have a nice quality of car for people to show up to. They get beat on. Yeah. But when people show up and see something a little bit nicer, I think they also treat it in a, in a nicer fashion. So we try to maintain them better than average. Could you run me through the process? We don't need to do it on this car, but uh, when you think about what you would do for your nut and bolt check and like how you check over the car, what do you specifically check over? Uh, first thing, um, yeah. the strut tops. So mm -hmm. while the car is down on the ground, check the tightness of the strut tops, check battery connections, things like that. Um, any subframe stuff that you can reach from the top, like the passenger front subframe uh, lower control arm bolt, you can still get to that stuff from the top. Check your fluids, of course. Um, anything that you can just do easily while the car's on the ground, get that stuff out of the way. Get it up to about chest height. Check your wheel bearings, check the tie rods, check for play. Um, look for funny tire wear, things that like once you have the car up in the air, you're gonna have to change like suspension arms and stuff like that. Can you come a little bit closer for the noise? Um, It'll minimize it a little bit. Keep yeah. going. You can check for tightness on the collars for the coilovers. BCs, I they, they've never come loose. Mm -hmm. So like I always check them, but they've never even come loose at all. Mm -hmm. Once I get the car all the way up in the air, then it's getting on to just nut and bolt. Uh, 
I use the actual wrenches and stuff that go on them. Chelsea wants me to like crescent wrench him real quick. He's twice as fast as I am. Mm -hmm. So like that's probably my biggest issue so far is just being slow. Mm -hmm. Come on, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, I'm gonna try not to. But uh, yeah, I'm really slow, but I try to be very diligent with the checks and stuff that I do on it. So I go through everything from subframe bolts to differential mounts, the actual axle bolts that bolt to the stub shafts in the differential, brake caliper bolts, like anything you can possibly get a hand on, mm -hmm. get a hand on it and just, I work my way all the way forward. And the last thing I do is the front suspension and then just looking for various leaks and stuff if you see a leak and you can't exactly pinpoint where it's from, wipe it off, clean it. I take a picture of it, post it in a notes app that Chelsea and I share. Mm -hmm. And then over the next couple of days, I see where it returns, if it returns at all. And then that way we know we're not just replacing parts for no reason. Mm -hmm. Are you checking ECUs and tunes and like pulling codes? Is there any type of data logging you do at all? Or is it all just physical? Uh, it's all physical. Um, when we're initially setting up the cars, we get a tune done by uh, RK Jordan. Mm -hmm. And other than that, like powertrain wise, the cars are dumb solid. Yeah. Yeah. Like engine issues are the least of my worries. The only thing you worry about is if you get water down in the coil packs. But other than oh, that. Because it misfiring because yeah. you're missing the plastics back there. Yeah. The majority of the cars have the plastics. Like one, I think, doesn't. And that's so. the one that always gets water back there. Yeah. Okay. What else do you I think I watch the cars are you, more than are you changing to. plugs very often? Are the plugs good forever? Do you change clutches? Are you, you can't really check that stuff. You just wait for a lot of that stuff to go bad. The biggest issue I think that we've had is like the clutch play in the actual pedal. Mm -hmm. And it's going through like systematically which cars have an issue, which cars don't, the clutch engagement point. Mm -hmm. And then we have to just detail every single part of the clutch system and find like the magical E36 clutch system that mm -hmm. has proper engagement. And I, part of me wonders sometimes if it's students like riding the clutch, because I'll get in the car. I drive every single car before I let a student get in them and they shift well. Mm -hmm. And then it'll be like halfway through the day, the students are like, it won't go into first gear anymore. And I'm just like, sometimes you get that faint whiff of clutch and you're just like, is it getting so hot that it's expanding and closing up tolerances? Like it's, I really try to dive into it, but I try not to let it eat up too much brain space. Yeah, and you were an engineer for Toyota, correct? Uh, no, I was, I was a technician, oh, technician doing engineering work. Okay. So when I left Toyota, I went to another company and they titled me as an engineer for mm -hmm. a little bit, but I feel like it diminishes some of my accomplishment because I'm, <laughs> I'm a college dropout. I'm not an engineer, you know, I. I found my true path when I went to UTI and started studying automotive directly. Mm -hmm. That's when I really, I felt like I got my ADD under control and I was able to focus. Mm -hmm. And since then, it's just like, okay, yeah, I found the perfect job for me being a test driver, working on engineering projects. I got my patent with Toyota. So like, that was a huge feather in my cap. Although I got to get a second one to make sure it wasn't a fluke. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's coming from that background I think I, I have much more of a focus on trying to just make sure things are done perfect mm -hmm. and not really taking into account the time that goes into it. And that's where like Chelsea's trying to help me balance that out. So back to the cars, what else are you doing specifically, you know, for prepping the car so we know? Um, are you checking, like, are y'all using the stock e-brakes with an extension on it? Are y'all doing hydro e-brakes? Are y'all having cable stretch? Are y'all having pads? Like, what do you do with the e-brakes? Uh, they're hydro inline brakes, uh -huh. so you still feel a little bit of feel through the pedal when you're, when you're through the foot pedal when you're using the e-brake, but that stuff we generally never have an it's issue so with. Like, Don't yeah, mess with it. Yeah, once it's bled Super properly, easy. no air in it, you just leave it alone. And even pads, they don't wear out quickly at all. Mm -hmm. You're not really supposed to be using the brakes going around park unless you are hauling ass. <laughs> and then there's only two places that you really use it. So. Yeah. Uh, so what are the biggest failures you see on the car? Something has to break. What specifically breaks in the cars? Assuming you keep the car on the track. <laughs> um, no, even assuming the like people going off and stuff, what are the things that you personally fix on the cars and that break? Tie rods, wheels, <laughs> body panels. Oh God, body panels, BMW with these damn plastic clips. And I'm sure that when everything is new and everything's fresh, 
they clip together and they work perfectly, but they do not wear well. You mean body panels inside the car? Exterior oh, yeah. body panels? The trim pieces on the bumper, like just... Oh yeah, oh. this is a beautiful E36 just yeah. sitting here behind us, <laughs> Dusty. Uh, uh, it's a great example. We could be giving examples of all the bolts and stuff to check, but he's doing a good job. I forgot that was there. Keep going. Yeah, uh, all of the trim stuff seems like when people hit cones, if you hit it anything over 20 miles an hour, especially when it's cold, you're just popping trim pieces off, and they can only do that so many times before they don't really go back on properly. Yeah. And it's it would be way too much of a hassle to try and refit all of those parts to make sure the cars visually look beautiful. Mm -hmm. We just try to make sure dynamically that they're very sound. Okay, makes sense. So we went over the prep, we went over what brakes. That's really minimal if that's all that breaks. Like you guys aren't going through clutches constantly. You're not going through, you know, what else? Nothing? No. Um, How are these cars as solid? That's crazy. You're not I, having like lifters tick real bad. You're not blowing head gaskets on the cars. No. No? No, and I mean, that's like even my last two students or it was a little bit more limiter than I would like, but it was a transition between wet and damp. And I, I had to teach two students how to drive manual first before we started the class. Oh God. So like there was not so much throttle control. It's either on or off. Yeah. So these engines for whatever reason, they can live at a higher RPM and they do really, really well. Mm -hmm. I think in the future, the Achilles heel for the school is gonna be actually transmissions. Mm -hmm. um, the clutches are okay, but the throwout bearings, the once you once you replace the uh, plastic pivot bushing, that becomes not so much of an issue. But people tend to ride the clutch, shift more than they need to. You can start the cars in second gear. You can drive the entire track in second gear. But I think people are used to driving cars in a specific RPM range. Mm -hmm. So they're just like, oh, I'm too high. I gotta go up into third. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, I'm, I'm too low. I gotta go down into first. So there's a lot more shifting that happens and I think that causes the most damage. Okay. Hmm. So what are the aftermarket parts that make those cars work so well? Um, you all have SLR kits on them probably, mm -hmm. maybe a racing seat? Uh, SLR on everything, NRG yeah. seats, NRG steering wheels. The hydro e brake from Willwood, the BC suspension. Other than that, with the SLR, it's like they're relatively simple. Which is do you all run an electric fan or do you run the stock fan? All of them are now e fan. There was, I think, one that was clutch fan for a while, but okay. they're now. What all specific e fan do you run? Like that y'all love? The, it's like the most gangster spall that they sell. Really? Oh, so y'all just go full in on the fan? Yeah, and it's stock radiator, aftermarket radiator, stock. Wow. So you just upgrade the fan and keep the stock radiator. Mm-hmm. Okay. I've I mean, actually had really good luck with mine with the stock radiator, so. Yeah, if we lose a radiator, then we upgrade. Mm -hmm. But I think just trying to be efficient with the school and making sure that in this early stage of running it, which like any business in the first five years is early stage, trying to keep costs minimal so that we can keep doing it. Because if, if Chelsea let me maintain the cars the way I want to, we'd be broke. By, yeah. by next year. So like, I really appreciate his guidance in that area because that's what's going to keep us going for the longevity and building a customer base with people that come back over and over. So one of the things I've always found kind of interesting is y'all were talking about doing some drifting stuff where there's a race truck going down, like a desert truck. That's really weird. I'm getting distracted. Okay, back to, did you see it? Oh yeah. Yeah, what was that thing? Uh, it was like some type of like weird Baja truck. Yeah, it, wasn't, like a it wasn't a drift car. Yeah. I know that. Okay, anyways, <laughs> back to, I got totally distracted. What I was going to say was, um, so we know about maintenance, we know about all these things. One of the things that would make or break a drift school is tire wear. So like, how many laps are they getting at a set of tires? How long, because Chelsea was telling me that he had a class where I think it was $200 to take 10 laps or so and get a little bit of schooling, mm -hmm. which seems so cheap, I could not put someone in one of my cars for $200, not for 10 laps, the tires cost more than that. How do y'all do it so cheap? Like, first of all, tire wear. How, about, how bad is a tire wear? How good is it? Tire wear so far is excellent. He, I think, spends quite a few hours searching for tires. And then he's also tried so many mm -hmm. that we're going back to the waterfalls now. Mm -hmm. And if you set them up with pressure properly, 
balance the front to rear grip the way that you need to. And then also being parked, that surface is absolutely immaculate. Yeah, and it's a tiny track. And yeah. you don't have the ability to be on long sweepers and stuff, so you're constantly switching exactly. back. So a ton of time off throttle, just like, it's not nothing like just like third gear, like, rah. So that helps out a ton. But uh, I don't know. I think I've seen Chelsea do a lap where I've heard him lift. That's two or Chelsea, three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no one else that's drives students. like that. Like I'm, I'm yeah. aspiring to drive like that. So how many laps do y'all get out of a set of tires, typically? I couldn't even tell you the number of laps. It's days. Out of a set of tires? Days. It, but cow. it also depends. So like my last two students, I had to teach them how to drive manual before we started the class. Yeah. But then you get the range of somebody that's been on a seto for 500 hours. It might take them an hour to get up to speed, and yeah. then they're ripping. And then you've got guys like uh, one of my students, Andy Debrino. He rides super moto, so he's used to sliding motorcycles around. Yeah. And it was two laps, and he was basically linking the whole track. That's the kind of guy that on a so full day Chelsea class, driving, he'll go through one set. With Chelsea driving, how long do they last? He, he's conscious of it. Yeah. If he's trying to murder tires, you can get rid of them in two laps. Okay. So you can be really hard on them there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you're hot lapping without using the but water But you pit, guys have like a day of tire wear normally. I would, I would think it's more. The average wow. student will not go through a set yeah. of tires. But they're, not a, they're also learning to drift, so that's not yeah. fair. Anywhere they wouldn't go through a lot of tires just because they're learning. And you guys yeah. also don't have a full skid pad and like donut thing and everything, yeah. which you were talking about you're going to get, but like... It's very limited on the, like, you have to be on the track and you have to be transitioning. You can't just sit there and do donuts and obliterate tires, which would be really hard on it. Yeah, that's like, okay. even my, my last two students that I taught, they had to struggle because they were teaching a karting session at the same time. Uh -huh. So, like, I'm teaching people that just learned how to do, man, do uh, manual shifting, mm -hmm. how to do donuts in a space, like, the size of this area. Yeah. And it's like, if you go any further, you're off track, dropping tires and stuff like that. So, it's... It's a difficult place to learn, mm -hmm. but I think it also forces you in some aspects to learn quicker mm -hmm. and to be more diligent with your learning. Mm -hmm. Whereas like if you were in a parking lot, you're more likely to like, oh, let me just ride out this donut where I'm not really learning anything. I'm just full throttle. It sounds cool. It looks cool, but you're not learning much there. When you're driving the track, you have a designated place to go. It's not a sea of cones, mm -hmm. things like donuts figure eights that's really difficult purely because you are cognizant of how close you are to the edge of the track and it freaks people out when you don't have that that spatial awareness of how big is an actual e36 where am i like do i sit a little crooked in this car is the steering wheel off there's like a whole bunch of things that go in that i don't think most people pay attention to mm -hmm. okay well i think we can wrap this up did you have anything to add anything you're passionate about Anything that you love, anything you want to talk about? Because we can keep chatting forever, but I think that we covered most of the points. You think we did? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I just, I'll say the biggest thing for me was my fear of leaving my job at Toyota mm -hmm. and then making this sort of transition into the motorsports community, which has been a long-term goal of mine. I would encourage people to just plan out your decision. Old Kelly? I'd be like, man, I'm not having fun here anymore. Fuck this shit. I'm gone mm -hmm. and figure it out later. And I feel like I planned my exit out so that the transition was relatively smooth. I mean, I still live in a van, but mm -hmm. I'm doing what I want to do every day. That's why I can't really tell you how many hours I work because. Because you live at where you work. You yeah. live in a van there. And probably because the van is so small, you probably spend a lot of time indoors working. Y'all have an indoor place, right? Or is it still a big tent I mean, thing? It's a tent. I mean, <laughs> technically indoors. I mean, you know, there's 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 and tent, tent. tent walls, you know. <laughs> yeah, is so, it warm enough in there during the winter? Do you hell think? no, hell no. I'm from Phoenix. I'm okay, dying up there. I I went and bought my own propane heater and stuff for the wow. shop. So like that's something that surprised me. Even just this past week, we've had a couple mornings where it's like 28 degrees. Whew. Yeah. Okay, so you're not used to that. No, and then Chelsea shows up. It's like we he had a, a full day of, of uh, private instruction, and I had my own students. So like he shows up, and he's all like toasty, warm, hopping out of his truck. I've already been outside for two and a half hours. I'm like yeah. shivering. And he probably thinks I'm exaggerating, but like this is what I'm used to. I'm just like yeah, yeah. It's beautiful out here right now. Summers are brutal here though. Yeah, I I still can't decide if I would rather be 
excessively hot or excessively cold. I, yeah. I don't know which one's worse. That's why I live in Texas. <laughs> Texas is pretty mild. <laughs> yeah, but like we only have a couple weeks of really hot and we only have a couple weeks of really cold. The rest yeah. of the year is pretty good. I'm also pretty like resilient to temperatures. I thought but, I Anyways, was. we don't need to talk about all the temperature stuff and everything. So Chelsea brought this thing, well you brought this thing out for Chelsea. So we're gonna have some fun on Drift Week and everything. It starts in, man, a little over a day. So I'm super excited. We're gonna bring you guys lots of content. Thank you so much. Cal oh wait, COVID. Is that what we're doing? No, I don't know, I'm joking. What? I don't know. It's virus time. I'm ready. People in the comments are like, why don't they have masks on? Yeah, <laughs> anyways. All right, thank you so much for watching. Bye guys, boom.